It all started with a very simple idea. Tell the stories of how successful middle market CEOs made it to the corner office. I'm Brand Handley, founder and managing director of Resource Options International, or ROI. We're the USA's premier executive search firm focused exclusively on empowering middle market companies to attract, hire, and retain A players while transforming top executives' careers and lives. ROI's Into the Corner office is dedicated to discovering how middle market CEOs advance their career, and we're making these remarkable and sometimes quite unbelievable stories available to you for the very first time. Listen and learn about the challenges they've overcome, the interesting people they've met along the way, and the lessons learned that steered these executives' unique journey into a middle market corner office of their own. I know you enjoy these CEO stories as much as I've enjoyed recording them. So thank you for listening today. And if you like what you've heard, rate us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm looking forward to you joining me on the next great middle market CEO adventure into the corner office. Today, my guest is CEO Robert Hall. After graduating from Oxford University in England with a BA in physics and mathematics, and then receiving his MBA in marketing and finance from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, Robert joined Nestle, where he gained marketing, sales, and general management experience. He also worked at other leading consumer goods companies, including P&G, Kraft, Nabesco, and Lennox. Robert is now the CEO of Old Smoky Distillery, the leading moonshine company in the U.S., and home of the world's most visited distillery. Robert Hall, welcome into the corner office. Thank you, Brent. Good to be here. <laughs> Great to have you here. Well, we always like to start these a little bit with uh, hearing about the backstory. And as we uh, discussed just prior to the podcast, we share a common employer in Procter & Gamble. I think we both started our careers there pretty much fresh out of school. So uh, I know that your journey began in the UK. So tell us a little bit about your early years, you know, where you grew up and, you know, what your family was like. Well, I, I was born at a very early age, um, <laughs> <laughs> like most people. Uh, but as, 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 as probably my, uh, my accent suggests, I was born in England, as, as you uh, indicated. I was actually an only child. Both my parents worked. Um, very, very supportive, um, uh, diligent, you know, c- caring people. But uh, I, I always aspired for, for more um, and, and worked hard to, to endeavor to, uh, to, to achieve that. What type of work did your parents do? Uh, my mother was a teacher, and my father was in the in government in government work. Got it. And they would have lived through the war years. Uh, and uh... Uh, absolutely, yeah. No, very. No, my fa- my father served uh, during during the war in the military, and my mother was a a, a teacher. Um, but has stories of being attacked. <laughs> oh, I can imagine. Uh, were they in London, or were they in no. areas that were bombed? No, my mother was actually in uh, Newcastle, which was a target for uh, for for the enemy, um, uh, and and had you know personal experiences. No, my father was in the military and was in a variety variety of of, uh, of fields, variety of areas. Yeah, and that uh, obviously leads, I'm sure, a lot to their uh, core beliefs. So tell us a little bit about that. You know, how were they uh, an influence over you growing up? What were some of the lessons learned in the parental experience? Oh, they, they were they were diligent people, um, caring, but um, uh, and and a very provided a very positive, uh, supportive uh, environment for me to to grow up in, and 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 were very caring. But w- one interesting learning is they were actually both unions in in union uh, positions. My mother was a teacher, and in the, in the teachers' union, my father was in the government, but in a in a, a local government union. And they had, um, I'd, say, I'd say, interesting attitudes towards work. You know, work was done at, at four o'clock or five o'clock, and and then you go about and do other things. And um, I felt that work was should be more than that. You know, they did work uh, because they felt they had to, and they they enjoyed it, but it wasn't. Uh, they weren't passionate about their work, and and I felt uh, that that I wanted to. Uh, seek an area where where I could be passionate uh, about it and and just put that extra effort in which I didn't feel they actually did so it was a very positive experience growing up but I saw that there perhaps was you know opportunity f- for improvement 
you know, we uh, hear a lot about that passion in these podcasts that we've done. Um, where do you think that came from? Was it kind of a, a self-motivated uh, area? Was there someone else that might have given that to you? Tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, kind of how you got that passion. I think I haven't really thought about that, to tell you the truth, Brent. It's, it's a very interesting question. I felt it was more self-motivation. Um, but I, I, I also, tr- also always try to kind of excel at school and, and, um, and just do my best and, and, um, uh, and, and, and endeavor to take a leadership role in, 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 as I was, as I was growing up. Yeah. And, Were you a good um, student in school, Robert? Uh, as it turned out, I, I, I was, um, and uh, was able to gain entrance to to Oxford actually without taking the entrance exams because I got some pretty good uh, results coming out of high school, um, and that fortunately helped me get into Procter and Gamble because I actually started working at Procter when I was only eighteen um, because I got some pretty good results out of high school and had a year off between um, high school and, and university, and so I was able to um, uh, wangle a job at Procter and Gamble in R and D. Uh, which was a wonderful uh, experience and very fortunate to have that. Now, did you grow up in, in the British private school system or the public school system? Which of the two? Um, well, it's, it's interesting you use that word public school system because in Britain, the public school system is actually the It's the opposite. School right? system. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's really weird vernacular. Um, no, I was in the, the state school, the, uh, the, the, the public schools to use the US, uh, US descriptive. Now, growing up in the UK is probably a little bit different than in the US. Uh, was there outside activities you were involved with? Uh, you know, any work, sports, music, theater? What were kind of some of your outside class pursuits? Yeah, no, I, I think uh, while there are certainly differences, there's there's more similarities. And so, yeah, there were a lot of outside activities. No, I was very much into sports, um, uh, playing playing sports, you know, many evenings, you know, most weekends. Uh, in the winter, I'd play uh, soccer, and in the, in the summer, I'd play cricket. Uh, but then I also played uh, indoor games like squash um, or, or badminton, which is a big, big um, sport in in the UK. No, I was very, very active. And then when I got into my middle teens, um, I worked on a farm actually, and uh, worked on Saturdays and and school school vacations. So those were kind of your entrepreneurial things that you did uh, during those years. Was that just for extra spending money? Well, no, I, I felt I ought, I ought to, you know, get a job and, and work. And uh, I also enjoyed, you know, being outside and doing farm work, actually, and met some met some good people. No, that, that was not really entrepreneurial, to tell you the truth, uh, although I was obviously going through in my mind what I wanted to do, and, and I enjoyed being on a farm. No, I did a few other entrepreneurial things. I bought and sold quite a quite a few things, bikes. And when I was at college, I bought and sold refrigerators and all sorts of things to to make a few extra shekels. Right, right. And were there specific um, things that you spent that money on, or did it go towards your education and supporting yourself during those years? No, f- fortunately, um, I, I was was blessed with with education that uh, I didn't have to pay much for um and uh, and also i was uh, blessed uh, through scholarships that uh, you know most of my living expenses were taken care of so no the 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 extra money just was for you know living and putting a little bit away so that when that you know when i needed to buy a car i could buy a car <laughs> exactly and the uh, scholarships that you received were those academic based yes yes fortunately uh, based upon um uh, results um, at high school. I, I won a scholarship to to Oxford, and then um, coming out of Oxford, I was able to uh, to win a Tehran scholarship, which was a, a full scholarship to the University of Pennsylvania, and, and I and I was able to um, uh, take advantage of that and uh, and attend Wharton. So, so you did those back to back, right? You went straight to Wharton I out did. of Oxford. I, I did, and the reason for that is because I wanted to move to the U.S. Um, I felt the U.S. could provide me with a lot more opportunities than I felt the U.K. could. And I realized that a kid with a physics degree uh, couldn't get into business in the U.S. because uh, people didn't really understand a physics degree. So <laughs> um, so I, I concluded after uh, some investigation that I really needed to get an MBA. And uh, 
in order to accomplish my goal of getting to the US and, and getting into business in the US. And so I set about figuring out how to do that and was fortunate to to win a full scholarship for a couple of years to uh, to Penn and was able to get the MBA at Wharton and then get into uh, in, into business right immediately after that. So the Proctor years, was that post uh, Wharton or uh, did you do some of those while you were still in the UK? No, I, I did um, uh, a good chunk of a year, not a full year, between high school and university when I was kind of a eight, gap year, I guess, 18, right? exactly, 18, 19. And that was in Cincinnati. Um, and then P&G, um, I was very fortunate, uh, offered me a job coming out of um, Oxford, uh, which I turned down in order to to get, get the MBA. But they then offered me a summer position uh, in marketing in the UK. So I, I worked uh, for the summer of 1975. Uh, and fortunately, they offered me a job coming out of Wharton. Um, but they, uh, you, as you may, may remember, were quite... Um, bureaucratic and, and had rules and that if if you were a foreign national as, as I was you had to start in your home country and I didn't want to do that so I opted not to join P&G uh, and uh, was able to secure a, a, a good situation with Nestle in uh, in uh, in the US in White Plains New York was it kind of a foregone conclusion that you'd go to college growing up? Uh, it sounds like both mom and dad obviously had educations given their professions. That my my parents absolutely encouraged me. Oh, there was no doubt about it. And unfortunately, during um, high school or grammar school, as it was called in the UK, um, I, I tended to be in the you know the the higher um, deciles, and um, it was always the the view was like you know. These these group of kids are going to go to college. It's just a matter of where, and uh, it was always in my mind to do that. And my parents were very uh, supportive of, of me achieving that. So physics—that's an interesting major. Tell us a little bit about your thinking around uh, picking that field of study. Well, I I was able to do it, and <laughs> it was <laughs> and uh, it's you not know, an easy I, subject by any means. No, but I, I enjoy. I, I'm say I was I. I was able to to figure it out. I was quite interested. Um, I found it easier doing uh, studying physics and succeeding in it than studying English or uh, you know English literature or, or or music or art. That just wasn't me. Um, I tended to be more on the on the left brain side, and I always you know did well at physics and maths and um, uh, decided. And that was just the natural you know. Uh, the, the UK education system is is different to the US where you focus at a much earlier age, which has positives, but it also has negatives. But um, one of the positives is that you, you know, you, 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 you gain more knowledge and greater expertise in a given subject. Uh, the negative is you have to choose earlier. And, and I think it's a much narrower ed- education. But anyway, I chose physics because I was good at it. And, and I was able to get good grades and and Oxford decided that they they wanted me, you know, to study there. So you know, you kind of go with the flow at the time, actually. And how have you found that that physics and maths background uh, has played out in your corporate career? Is that something that you've gone back to and relied on, or has played a significant role in, you know, some of the uh, some of the challenges you've had along your career? Well, I, I think um, I realized when um, I was at Oxford studying physics that it wasn't something I would enjoy for the rest of my life. I didn't, I felt <laughs> I, I didn't have a passion at it, uh, uh, with it. And I really wanted to uh, get to the U S I wanted to, uh, really have an impact on the world. And I felt I could have a, a greater impact in business leading an organization. And that's what uh, got me thinking about, you know, studying, you know, for, for an MBA. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I honestly would, rarely use what I learned in, in physics um, uh, in, in my everyday life, but I think it helped me get to where I, where I am today because it, it has allowed me to get you know scholarships and, and uh, get into good, good universities. And, and I think that, that helped me develop. And I think when I look back at my education, I think, I think it, it really helped me think. So yes, I did learn, I learned some facts which are probably irrelevant, but I think it, it really hurt, it helped me think through problems. Developed your analytical um, skills. Very mm-hmm. much so, and, and um, helped me uh, with, with numbers, and uh, numbers in business are 
pretty important. And so, uh, and people are, uh, at my company here today sometimes make fun of me about liking numbers too much, but uh, I think <laughs> Not as, a bad as, skill for a CEO. <laughs> well, I, I, think, I think it's actually helpful to uh, to actually base decisions on data, and and uh, so I think the the quantitative background uh, really helped me. Um, in, in terms of analyzing problems and, and uh, manipulating data to draw conclusions. And, and, and then, then it becomes more judgmental about what do you do with that, but it, it at least got me a, a good start. And um, hopefully that's uh, helped me you know, make some good or better decisions uh, uh, along the way. So what was the attraction about coming to the U.S.? Was it uh, mostly from, you know, getting your MBA here? I mean, there's certainly great schools in Europe as well that uh, offer that type of master's experience. Or did you know or have an inkling that you really wanted to work here and, and begin your career in the U.S.? No, the the MBA was a vehicle to allow me to work in, in the U.S. And I concluded that I did want to live and work in the U.S. during the year. Uh, that I spent with uh, Procter and Gamble before returning to to Oxford, I realized that there were. Well, that's many... right. That was in Cincinnati, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. Right. So I re- I recognized there were many more opportunities here. The, there was an attitude towards work hard, play hard, where at the time in the UK the attitude was you know work as as little as you can and then going enjoy yourselves and it was a a more um, but more socialistic. I think the UK has changed since then, and I think has has really progressed. So uh, I'm really referring to the UK of forty odd years ago, um, pre pre Margaret Thatcher. Pre Margaret Thatcher, yeah, and, and, the, <laughs> and the world was very different then. Yes, um, it was. But I, that was the world I was living in, and uh, you have to make you know judgments based upon the information you have at hand. And um, I, I made a decision that I really wanted to uh, to come to the US, and the, the MBA al- allowed me to. To do that and uh, and and find good opportunities uh, after after graduation, it sounded like you stayed very true to that type of you know reaction that you had uh, to what you saw in your parents and your parents' generation in terms of their behavior towards work. R- right, I, I I felt I I moved moved beyond what they what their view was, and uh, and I've been very happy as a, as a result of that. Felt I worked hard along the way, but also very. I, I enjoy coming to work, and um, uh, and uh, and it's and, and that's why what's kept me working as uh, I think as hard as, as as I've done over over time. So first job post MBA, uh, Nestle up in White Plains. Uh, did you move into a marketing brand management type of role there? Yes, yes. Uh, starting at the lowest levels uh, in in marketing, brand right? assistant, uh, exactly. the, the typical path. Exactly. And then uh, leadership responsibilities fairly early on. When were you managing people there? Two, three years in? No, it was it was actually a little bit quicker than that. Um, due to some some changes in the organization, uh, no, I was I was actually promoted to be what, what was called acting product manager um, after about nine months, actually, um, of of Taster's Choice, which was a, a significant brand at, in Nestle at the, those days. Um, Freeze dried coffee has actually declined declined over the, <laughs> over the last few years as as uh, as ground coffee has become more uh, more convenient to make. But uh, freeze dried coffee was a was a, a pretty material business, and um, so I was asked to be acting product manager, and that, and that evolved into a product man- uh, you know full product manager soon after that. But I was I was managing people. Um, I think it was about nine months into my career at Nestle, actually. Awesome. What were some of those earliest leadership lessons you? Uh, Learn from that job. Well, I I, I was a uh, I was honoured to to be given that responsibility, but I was also I felt a little awkward because I tended to be younger than than most of the other people around, and so I was asked to you know to to be manager of people who had more experience than me, and um, and that, that's a, a little bit of an awkward feeling, and and I I think that when I look back, I tended to manage rather than lead. Um, and I tended to be into more details, um, than I probably should have been. Now, fortunately we were successful and the business moved, moved ahead. Um, and so I, um, uh, I, I, I'm not viewing it as, 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 as a negative experience, but one that I felt looking back, I probably could have, um, could have done better, but I think that was a learning experience and, and that's, uh, that's the way, I, way, way I viewed it. 
What are some of the earliest leadership lessons you, you received from bosses and mentors? Good and bad, I might add, because <laughs> sometimes those examples can be just as forming. Mm. No, I, uh, I was around some very good people at Nestle, and um, uh, one of one guy, I just was really impressed by his organizational skills. He could, um, he, he he could respond to questions about any variety of topics. And while he didn't necessarily have everything in his in his mind, he could go to a piece of paper, which is what what we were dealing with at the time, and say, "Okay, you know, this is the this is the answer to that question. These are this is these are the facts. This is what happened. Um, these are my thoughts on it." So just being organized was uh, I was just very very impressed by that, and and particularly when you're working for somebody who is organized, it's just much more efficient. If somebody's disorganized, you, you waste so much time <laughs> getting organized in order to, you know, get get the data and make an appropriate decision. So I think just very, it's very simple. But I was just impressed by his organization, and I've always tried to to emulate that so that people who work for me can 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 be helped by that uh, rather rather than hindered. And then there was an, another lesson, another boss I had, he didn't try to do everything. He did a few things and tried to do them very well. And there's good and bad in that. Um, The good is that he did get some things done, there's no question, and he definitely had an impact on the business. There was frustration because, oh, I know X, Y, Z, he's not going to bother with that. We're going to have to figure it out. And and I, I can't go to him for help on this one. Um, so there were negatives to that, and so I've I've tried to learn from that to to be a leader who can help the people in the organization, um, but also focus when you have to focus, and and uh, and if you have to focus to the and miss other things during those three or four days that you have to focus. Well, you you work extra hard to get caught up. You know, soon, soon thereafter. Um, so I've I've tried to take the the, the positive out of uh, 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 out of those uh, experiences. Well, Robert, you've had a wonderful career and worked through a, a number of great companies, large and small, and now, of course, in the private equity world. How would you say your leadership style has evolved over time? I think I've I've tried to evolve um, from being a manager to being a leader. Um, Rather than looking to every detail and checking every expense account and and checking every detail that a, a person has considered, to rather being a leader and setting the goals and establishing the overall direction, incorporating people's input in, into that direction, um, and then helping the team get there. And I, I think a lot about the the phrase uh, servant leadership, um, and and then there's a, a phrase which is not quite doesn't sound quite as good, but also teacher or teaching leadership. Um, and I think uh, as 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 you go through your career, you, you I, I certainly try and learn and, and encourage everybody to do that, and you end up when you are managing people who are. Um, not as far along in their career, you 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 can help them, you can teach them, and um, I find uh, helping the people who work in the organization and, and hopefully teaching them in in a in a constructive manner rather than not not looking down to them, but you know helping them you know develop, finding ways for them to develop further. I think has uh, has been a course that I've been uh, en- endeavoring to, uh, to 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 pursue um, to to to. To evolve from management into that that leadership, providing the 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 the, the vision uh, that we want to try and work work towards, and then helping people get there, and and using the uh, the carrot approach rather than the stick approach. How do you decide if it's time to micromanage or when to stay out of the sandbox, so to speak? I think business results. If if the business results are bad, <laughs> I I tend to gravitate. I zoom, zoom, <laughs> zoom in, yeah, and and that's when I start to you know get into the data and uh, and and try and try and learn. 
um, and 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 help help people, you know, figure out a good solution. But if things tend to be going well, I I very much stay out and um, give enough uh, reins to uh, and, and drive the train. G- yeah, g- give the reins to the to the other folks in the organization. Now, Old Smokey is a, a fairly well established organization. How long have they been in business? Well, it's it's not really um, long long established. It, it was only founded in two thousand and ten. Okay, uh, so it. it's only been eight years, actually eight years uh, in about a month's time. Um, so it's really very, very new, and has only been in uh, the products have only been in wholesale distribution for for about seven. Uh, it took it took a while um, to get them into wholesale distribution, and um, no, so the, it's it's a relatively uh, new new company and growing growing rapidly. Well, that's a that makes the, the question I'm going to ask even more interesting, which is kind of your thoughts on building a company culture. You know, sometimes you come into a well-established company, and particularly a CEO, and, you know, there are so many guidelines and and, and uh, boundaries around which, you know, you, you've got to work. Whereas it sounds like here you probably really have an opportunity to to work and develop that. Tell us a little bit about that and, and your thoughts around building a company culture. Right. Well, I think it's it's really important. Um, now, I uh, took uh, assumed my responsibilities at the very beginning of 16, so it's been about two and a half years. So the company was in existence for a little over five years uh, prior to that. So, it, it, and it, and it was a company with some culture. Um, there's no question about it. And I, th- I think a good good culture as well, um, because it started in uh, a, a retail business um, with a distillery where which people could visit. And uh, and products that they could try on site and um, and and buy. Unfortunately, they have bought in significant quantities, and it tended to be a, a fun environment, um, and uh, w- with with a lot of good people. Um, so it wasn't. I think it started as a family business, right? It, you mentioned well, that earlier. family. It started as a private business. Private business. Three. Mm-hmm highly entrepreneurial attorneys actually started it. So it wasn't, you know, one family started it. It was uh, three, uh, three, three attorneys who w- were very bright and highly energetic and um, very, very creative as well. Um, uh, and, and, and it, it, I'll, I'll mention that now. And that's, that's why um, uh, there's some, a f- few people have joined the organization because the the attorneys realized that they didn't know everything and they needed some other people to um, help you know guide guide the business going forward and so those attorneys actually sought some private equity investment and were open to uh, some you know managers from outside the company coming in to you know provide some leadership so and in that regard it's been very collaborative um, but those three uh, people were, were Highly intelligent, very creative, uh, highly uh, energetic, and and did develop a good culture. They were good people, and um, and so this was a company that was, you know, not struggling, not broken. It was it was fundamentally a good company, and so I've endeavoured to to really build on those strengths um, to continue to to make it a a fun place to work, which we we try to do, but we've. Uh, really defined some values, and um, and we've put a lot of time into defining what the values uh, are that we we want to work towards and, and and have and live, and then we have to live by them. And so I think setting values and then living by them is is what builds a culture. And uh, and I and I think uh, and I think we we have that. And I think what differentiates us from many places is that we we have. A fun time. We're in a fun business. While we're in the distilled spirits business, we're also in the entertainment business um, because we have people. We have you know millions of people come through our our distilleries and our stores, and they usually leave with a smile, and we want them to leave with a smile. And um, and 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 uh, so we are. We do feel we're in the entertainment business as well as in the spirits business. Let's talk a little bit about the people that uh, you bring in. What, what do you look for when you're making bets on the people you invest in? Well, we uh, we we bring in people from all over because we are a national company. But the 
center of gravity of our operation is in East Tennessee. So the bulk of our herring is in East Tennessee. And we look for people who we believe uh, would would live the values that that we are that um, uh, that, that we believe in, uh, you know, the basic ones of honesty, integrity, tra- transparency, working on a team basis, you know, a we orientation rather than a, an I orientation. Um, you know, people who would, you know, have respect for 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 other people and perspectives and the environment and the community, um, you know, going forward. So. And, and we have some other values, but those are those are critical ones. But then, do they have the experience to do what we need to get done? I, I think um, you know when we look for people, we kind of set criteria of what does this person, what should this person be able to do, and then we try and evaluate: will they be able to do that based upon their experiences and uh, their, their their overall background? How do you personally interview and hire? I, I think I'd I'd go through that process, Brandt, uh, setting the criteria. What what am I looking for? What are my goals? Uh, perhaps idealistic, but but you have to have a set of goals that then you know when you when you achieve them, and then uh, th- then th- 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 then talk to people who uh, have a chance of, of making them, and then trying to uh, get the best fit based upon an evaluation against the criteria that you set, as well as evaluating would they be people who we, I believe would live live up to the values that we've set for the organization. How many employees does Old Smokey have today? About 350. And do you get involved in hiring beyond kind of your direct reports? One level down sometimes, but not always, depending on the situation. And if you had only about five minutes to interview someone that was like kind of one level down, what would you ask them? I'd, I'd start off by asking them what are their strengths what are their weaknesses and where do they think they can improve and what would they want to improve on? So strengths, weaknesses, opportunities to improve. And then if, if, if there was extra time uh, with, within that, how do they think they could add value to the company? Well, Robert Hall, you've been very, very generous with your time. Thank you today. We've got one last question we'd like to ask all the CEOs. And, and that's kind of what career and life advice would you give to someone who's got their eyes on the corner office? That's a very, very, Interesting question. I think you've got to make sure that you have the passion and the persistence to get there because it's a, it's a road, it's a journey, and you've got to work hard along along that road in order to be recognized and then be given that responsibility. Um, and then you've got to understand the demands of that responsibility because you tend to live in a fishbowl. Everybody's watching you. You've got to set an example every day, and you've got to think about what you say and how you say it, because you want a, a, a motivated set of people in the organization who want to do their job, and you've got to act in a manner that that fosters that uh, in, environment rather than being dictatorial that nobody wants to work for. You've got to think about how you communicate that. So there's a lot of demands of, of the job, and so you've got to be ready to... Uh, to, to accept that responsibility and not everybody does and that, that's okay um but if you are interested you've you've got to understand the very significant demands of the responsibility and then i think uh, i think the most important thing is learn all the time when you're evaluating uh, opportunities don't make a decision for an extra three or four thousand dollars a year Make a decision on where to work based upon where you will learn the most and uh, continue to grow as an individual because when you graduate school, whether it's with an MBA or just or, or a bachelor's, you may think you know a lot and you do know a fair amount, but there's an awful lot to learn and you've got to keep learning throughout your career and uh, uh, because hey, there's a ton more to learn, even if the world was stable, but we all know the world <laughs> isn't stable. The world is changing uh, all the time Daily. And, and you've really <laughs> got to keep up. So, uh, I think what, one of the aspects of the organization, which I, I endeavor to, uh, to, to encourage is just making us a learning organization. And so we, we learn from our mistakes. And I say, if you don't make mistakes, you're not trying hard enough, but let's make, if we do make a mistake, let's kind of cut it off as quick as we can. So we 
cut our losses, but then learn from it. And how can we do better the next time? And and that's okay. Having some failures is absolutely okay. But let's make sure we learn we learn from them. And uh, that's true uh, of of each individual. We've got to learn as much as we can. And um, and particularly if you're aiming for the corner office, you've got to learn about. Uh, all aspects of the business in order to provide leadership to all functions in, in, in the company. Robert, thanks again. We've really enjoyed hearing your story in the corner office. Good. I, I certainly hope it helps. All the very best. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Into the Corner Office with Brant Hanley. We hope you enjoyed hearing our guest CEO story as much as we did. If you want to hear more CEOs reveal their journey into the corner office, please subscribe via iTunes and tell your friends and colleagues. For more information about Brant, Resource Options International, and the mighty middle market, visit www.goforroi.com. We look forward to having you join us for our next episode. 